Elie Wiesel famously said, For the dead and the living, we must bear witness. For the world outside, it is impossible to imagine what went on in there. For those who survived to ascend and take the stand called for admirable courage and commitment. Today, we are at the Netherlands Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, the NIOT, to pay tribute to six individuals who heeded the call to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. People whose testimony caused some of the perpetrators to face justice and challenged society with the implications of their horrific real-life experiences. There were many, in many countries, who confronted evil and injustice in this manner. Today, our spotlight is limited to the symbolic number six. We focus on six individuals whose Holocaust experience started in the Netherlands and was ultimately conveyed on the witness stand. Through the stories of Anatje Fels, Ben Sayes, Josef Michman, Charlotte Salzberger, Jules Schelfis, and Rudi Curtisus, we honor the memory of six million victims who perished in the Holocaust. For the soul of man is a candle of God. Rudi Curtisus, one of these brave individuals who refused to allow darkness to cloak his past, will light the candles, bringing light into a world so desperately in need for more light. For the dead and for the living, we must bear witness. Annetje Fels, I, I never met her and I'm so very sorry that I never had the opportunity to meet her because when you look at all the things that she did after being liberated, after being repatriated to the Netherlands, she is a great source of inspiration. Not only was she a founding member of the Dutch Auschwitz Committee, uh, she always uh, very much was dedicated to the memory and the commemoration of the Shoah, but also in uh, information, uh, education about the Shoah, uh, about acknowledging what happened and about justice being repaired. In 1956, Karl Klauberg, who was the gynecologist of Auschwitz, well, a so-called gynecologist, he experimented in Auschwitz on thousands of women and he was exchanged in the 50s from a Soviet prison back to Germany and then he was accused and in order to prepare the trial against Karl Klauberg the International Auschwitz Committee called upon all the, all the branches of the Auschwitz committees in the different countries to look for possible witnesses at a trial against Klauberg. And that's when Annetje Fels uh, really became the founding member of the Dutch Auschwitz Committee. So the reason for the Auschwitz Committee in the Netherlands uh, to become a, a foundation, which it is still today, uh, is laying in the fact that a criminal of Nazi crimes was put on trial in Germany. Klauberg um, uh, never faced the judge. He died in the preparation of his trial in prison and there was never a process, a trial against him. Uh, but the Dutch Auschwitz Committee was established and um, the, the, the speaker and the chair became Annetje Fels. There were two other occasions when Annetje Fels played a very important role in bringing to justice or keeping punished Nazi perpetrators. Uh, the first, uh, of course, being uh, the Auschwitz trials as they were held in Frankfurt in the 60s, where she performed uh, the role as a, a witness during those trials. Having survived Auschwitz and the death marches, she explained what happened in Germany. In the Netherlands, there were already trials against Nazi criminals as early as the late 40s. In the prison of Breda, originally four, but later three uh, Nazi criminals were kept prison until in 1972, the then Minister of Justice, Dries van Acht, took the initiative to pardon them. And the pardon that he wanted uh, to give them had to be 
uh, agreed upon in the Dutch parliament. Now a special hearing was organized in the Dutch parliament and during that hearing, not only Professor Bastiaans, who is specialized in the trauma caused by these criminals to the victims, was heard, but also Annetje Fell spoke. And she spoke from her heart and she touched many and the vote as was prepared by Dries van Acht, switched as a result of her testimony. The three of Breda were not pardoned in 1972, thanks to her and her witness role during that parliamentary hearing. Annetje Fels did much more than looking for justice and acknowledgement. She fought for education, she fought for memory, for recognition, she brought survivors together and able to support each other. And as such, uh, as a survivor, as a representative of her generation, uh, as a woman, she's a great source of inspiration to me. My colleague from the Netherlands Institute for War Documentation, Ben Seijs, was a very emotional man. He testified as an expert witness in Vienna in 1965 against the war merchant Dr. Erich Jakowitz, who was suspected of having organized deportation of Jews from the Nazi-occupied Netherlands. In the witness stand, Ben Seyers practically lost his voice. He could barely whisper. The excellent biographer of Seyers, Richter Ruchold, has described what Seyers, a self-made intellectual son, of the Amsterdam Jewish proletariat, which was completely murdered in the Nazi death camps, felt at the time. Through his voice, others whispered. His sister and her husband, both of his parents, his grandfather, and all the family members, friends and neighbors from the poverty-stricken Amsterdam Jewish quarter who had been killed in the camps, they whispered through him. At the end of the day, Ryakovic was convicted, but Seyers fell ill, seriously ill. The fears he had experienced, living underground as a Jewish fugitive under Nazi occupation returned to him with terrifying force. Before that, Seyers, who had not graduated from university, has worked as a laborer in the Amsterdam shipping yard. And his proletarian, very leftist but non-communist background, together with his experiences in the shipyard, go a long way into explaining his sensitivity for the plight of the laboring forces under Nazi occupation. This very non-academic man published four wonderful books on the Dutch laboring classes under occupation. A book on the February strike of 1941, a book on the April Mill May strike of 1943, a book on a Nazi raid in Rotterdam in 1944, and a book on Dutch forced laborers in Germany. But as an expert witness against Ryakovic and against Adolf Eichmann, Seyers demonstrated his precision as a historian with a talent for legal matters as well. This rare combination of talents fully justified his appointment of this leftist radical as a professor at Leiden University, which as you know, is a traditional bulwark of the Dutch bourgeoisie. Back in the 90s, when I was working and living in Israel, I had the privilege of working together on a large research project with Jo Michman, or Josef Melkman, as he was born in Amsterdam. And Jo Michman lived in Jerusalem, I lived up north in Israel. And every Tuesday I used to travel to his home in order to work on the, on the things that we did. Jo Michman was not only a survivor of the Shoah, of the Holocaust, um, but he also um, emigrated uh, to Israel in the 50s and became one of the first directors of Yad Vashem. Uh, so he was a scholar and extremely knowledgeable about the history of the Shoah, not only in theory from books and archives, but also as a survivor. Now one Tuesday, I. I came over to Jerusalem to work with him a full day uh, and it was different than all the other days I used to do that. 
And the difference was that he was dressed different. He was uh, waiting for me in his uh, home, all dressed up in a woolen suit, far too warm for the Israeli climate. And he explained to me that he had a lecture uh, later on that day and that he was already dressed up uh, uh, for his audience. And then he told me that it was a suit that he had already for a long, long time. Uh, he wore it when he was a witness at the trial uh, of Eichmann in 1961. Adolf Eichmann, of course, one of the perpetrators of the Shoah, was taken to Israel uh, by the Israeli intelligence and stood trial in 1961 in Beta Am in Israel. Yo Michman uh, was invited by Gideon Hausner, the prosecutor of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem, to testify about the persecution of Jews in the, in the Netherlands and in Belgium. Josef Michman was of course a scholar. He knew uh, as a researcher uh, well uh, what to testify and what occurred during the persecution. In his testimony, he added also personal memories of what happened to him and to his wife, the things he saw and the things he experienced, the humiliation. Here he was in Bet Ha'am in 1961, in May. It must have been a warm spring day, all dressed up. So for him and his wife, apparently as well, it was very important that he would face Eichmann in the court being a very civilized man. So he dressed up, dignified, very much in contrast of all the experiences he had during the Shoah. So here in this house of the people, the Bet Ha'am, which functioned as a court, he symbolized civilization yet again, after the war, after the Shoah. Now, when you look at some of the footage that was taken during the Eichmann trial, you see him uh, um, uh, telling uh, about the Shoah as it occurred in the Netherlands. And you also sometimes get a glimpse of the audiences. And most of the people in the audience also dressed up. For them, it was very special. For them, it was a statement to confront themselves with one of the perpetrators uh, that caused so much trauma in this court, in the state of Israel, being civilized, being dignified, human. My name is Eli Salzberger. Uh, I was born in Jerusalem uh, to Lotte Salzberger, who was the witness at the Reichmann trial. My mother was born in Frankfurt am Main, Germany, in uh, 1923, to an ultra-Orthodox family uh, with a very comfortable life. My grandfather was a businessman, he became a partner. Everything changed in 1933 when the Nazis came to power. And my grandfather, Leo, decided to move the whole family to Amsterdam. They were arrested on a Saturday morning, just before sitting for breakfast in their house, and were deported first to uh, uh, Westerbrook. And from there, my grandmother, mother and sister, uh, to Ravensbrook. Next is a very interesting part of the story where uh, there was an order to move my mother and her sister from Ravensbrück to Theresienstadt. And this was already quite late towards the end of the war. An SS officer appeared in Ravensbrück with this warrant and took these two teens uh, to, with him in public transportation. And we're told that a very important person will come to interview them. Uh, they were held there about uh, a week before this officer, this uh, person came to interview them, and this was Adolf Eichmann. He wanted to know what do they know about the final solution, and he asked them, they uh, said that they don't know anything, and he said to them that if they will tell anything that they know in the ghetto, they will go up the chimney. And this was a very important key testimony afterwards in the Eichmann trial. 1960, Adolf Eichmann was captured and brought to trial. 
and my mother was a key witness in this trial because of this personal encounter and his inquiry about the final solution, which were a very important piece of evidence that he himself knew about the final solution and tried to hush it up. My mother came out of this trial um, with much more vigor uh, to accomplish what she saw her life mission uh, as helping people, not only Holocaust survivors. She later became a deputy mayor of Jerusalem uh, and uh, established uh, the borough system in Jerusalem. Uh, she founded, uh, during the first intifada, the hotline for uh, helping Palestinian victims of Israeli police and forces. Some people became very nationalistic and self-centered. Others became very universalistic and aiming to help the other. My mother was in the latter camp. And I think this is also one of the ramification of her testimony in the Eichmann trial and putting the Holocaust in a very different light. I would like to introduce to you Jules Schelvis. Schelvis was a co-plaintiff in two German trials against perpetrators from Sobibor death camp. As a young man, he survived both the Sobibor and the Birkenau death camps. That was impossible, but he did it. Like Ben Seyers, the social democrat Jules Schelvis came from the working classes of Jewish Amsterdam. And during his transport to Sobibor in 1943, Jules Schelvis brought his guitar with him. He imagined that after working hours in Sobibor, there would be outdoor campfires, sing-alongs and merry guitar playing. But in Sobibor, his wife, Rachel Borsikowski, was murdered upon arrival. The last 35 years of his long and fruitful life, from 1980 to his death, Schelvis wrote and spoke about Sobibor death camp without ever taking a break. He was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Amsterdam in 2008 because of his book on Sobibor. And the moment he took a break, in 2016, he died. In a truly moving speech on May 4, 2020, the Dutch King William Alexander remembered Jules Schelvis. He described his testimony as the one he would never ever forget. Schelvis had asked himself during his speech, why nobody made an effort to protest against the deportation of the Jews. Schelvis described the segregation of the Jews as a process that once started was practically impossible to stop. Sobibor began in the Amsterdam Vondelpark, the king said. The king also stated that it's our duty not to look away when our fellow citizens are marginalized. Do not accept as normal what is not normal. Only by respect for and defense of our democracy can we protest and protect ourselves against arbitrary politics and racial madness. The king emphasized that selfish had never lost faith in humanity, even in the death camps. As an atheist humanist and a social democrat, Schelvis would have agreed with the king. And my guess is, that he would have been very content with this praise coming from the king. He would have chuckled to himself, I think. And this speech of our king, well, this speech makes me proud to be a Dutchman. I'm Rudy Cortisos. First of all, I should explain to you that Rudy is not my name. Rudy is the name my parents gave me during the war when I was hidden and uh, by tomorrow I will be 83 years of age. I have a uh, nice family, a uh, wife, two children, four grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. As far as the Holocaust is concerned um, and my connection with this period is uh, the um, uh, Lem Yanyuk trial. My mother was cast 
by Damianyuk in 1943, together with uh, 62 other members of my family, both in Sobibor and in Auschwitz. The last thing I could do for my mother was to be present four times during the Damianyuk trial. We were all together with 21 Dutch um, co-plaintiffs. It's difficult to um, s explain my feelings when entering that courtroom. Five German judges, uh, all dressed in black, assistants dressed in black, the Red Cross, police, uh, to guard the Mianyuk. I can't forget. I can never forget. When I um, showed the court the letter my mother wrote in the train to Sobibu, explaining, telling her husband, her son, that um, uh, she was on her way to the east. She was uh, um, together with 70 other people in the train wagon. Um, some of them, some of them she knew, but it was a mess, not knowing where they were going, how long it would take. Etc. That letter was thrown out of the uh, of the train between uh, Assen and Nieveshans, the border. President of the uh, court asked me whether he could have that letter. So I answered, "No, you can't have it. You can see it." And he understood very well what it meant to me. I explained to everybody that when I am at the dentist office and um, they um, treat my teeth, my thoughts go back to um, Sobibo and Auschwitz where they pulled out the golden crowns, the golden teeth of everybody. When I am um, getting up at night to do a pee, pee I think of the train where each uh, wagon had two tons, one for water, one to be used as a toilet. My thoughts go back to that moment. Um, so this was, in fact, my proof to the judges. It is very important that generations after me are being informed by survivors of the Holocaust because it plays a role every day. It still plays a role every day.